Hi, and welcome to Be More Super, the podcast. I'm Brian, your host, and this week we've got a great treat for you. Coming straight from Amazon Prime's hit show, Hunters, we've got Louis Ozawa. He's a great actor. You've seen him in Predators, uh, Spectral, Supergirl, Born Legacy. This man has been in most things that you've seen recently, and he's a great actor, and I'm honoured to have him on the show. So I'm sure we'll be chatting about Al Pacino and lots of other things. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. And as always, our episode is brought to you by the wonderful people at Prop Store of London. So visit their website, propstore.com, and check out all their screen news, props, and costumes to buy, to take home. And also, they've got a payment plan, so if you want to spread the cost between two to six months, you can. So check them out at propstore.com. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy our episode and our chat with Louis. Welcome to Be More Super, the podcast. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. An action-packed podcast where we'll discuss all things entertainment. They're the answer to our we alone in the universe. Conventions, prop collecting, cosplay, interviews, reviews, and so much more. The show starts with host Brian Gardner right now. So, Louis, thank you so much for joining us on Be More Super, the podcast. Um, how, the, how the hell are you? I mean, how is lockdown uh, treating you over in the States? Um... Well, uh, you know, it seems like there's a little light in the not too distant future right now. Los Angeles is starting to um, open up a little bit. Um, Yeah, um, the weather here is incredible right now. Um, People are, you know, socially distancing, wearing masks, but out and about, enjoying the weather, getting some exercise in. Um, Yeah. Yeah, not too bad. I mean, yeah. as 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 a fellow parent of uh, mm-hmm. two little girls myself, and oh. you, you as a parent as well, um, how's yeah. how how how's things going with the kids? You know, uh, with the lockdown and and homeschooling and and you know teaching them, you know what's go going on because it's got to be a very confusing time for them. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Well, you know, my my youngest is only seven months, so he's kind of, you know oblivious to all of this but uh my five-year-old it's taken uh quite the emotional toll on him it's really tough for the kids i feel most most unfortunate for them actually they they need the social interaction and they're dying to have that you know play with their friends and stuff and they just can't and i feel so bad but i suppose you know after after all this finishes Mm -hmm. i think it's a Mm -hmm. giant reset button on humanity on how we <laughs> yes. how we approach each other, uh, all those people that we want to hug and be with, uh, is to be honest, it's going to be a, a, a cleaner planet. Um, it's going to be, you know, a, a nicer place to be around because we're going to appreciate things a lot better, aren't we? I hope we do. I hope we do. I hope we don't go back to our own ways. You know, there's there's a part of me that just yeah uh we are we are animals after all we are put on this earth just like all the other animals to consume you yeah. know and um i'd love to believe that we have the ability to change the course of our destiny as a, as a, um, a species of animal but there's kind of the uh, the realist in me that also feels like who's to say that we're any better than the dinosaurs you know like my my son my son right now is obsessed with dinosaurs and he's just so confused as to how they could just die off and well um you know and how lucky are you happens yeah my my (laughs) my daughters are obsessed with frozen so uh. daddy's got to be dancing with them every five minutes and watching that movie about 24 <laughs> times. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about you, Louis. Yeah, I was sure. going to I was going to start off the interview speaking a little Japanese because oh. I worked for a Japanese company years ago called Muji in London. And, oh, um, yes. Yeah. And wow. wonderful, wonderful people at head office. The yeah. top, top top floor was us. The bottom office was all Japanese and mm. what a what an amazing culture! Uh, so I was going to go uh, yokosa, is it yokosa? Which is yokoso, yokoso, 
which is yeah. wel- welcome. That is as far yeah. as I get with Japanese, so I do apologize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we but, could say, Yokoso, Yoroshiko Negashimas, which means, um, yeah, welcome. Uh, I don't know. It's it's hard to translate. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 it, it is a beautiful language, but I, I can imagine very difficult to learn. Um, so so I won't yes, attempt yes. it. I'm, I I am still working on English myself. To be fair, yeah. So <laughs> so your career is 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 absolutely is just blown up. It really really has. Uh, the first time I saw you uh, perform, um, you know, in something was Predators, which is wow. an absolutely amazing movie because you know it's a massive franchise. And you mm-hmm. play the silent but deadly uh, killer, Hanzo, and you come face to face with the Predator. What was it like working on that movie? And what was it like when you saw the Predator for the first time? You know, it's strange that you mentioned that because right now there's been kind of, I don't know if it's because of the lockdown or maybe because it's been 10 years, if you can believe it, since yeah. that movie. I, I can't believe it. Um, since that movie came out, I've had so many kind of requests and questions about that movie actually i think people are like going back and revisiting the movie and um realizing it's a really underappreciated film like from my biased highly biased opinion i really do feel like it ranks up there with the original like maybe you know maybe that one being number one and our movie being number two right behind it we we really you know it is a modern day homage to that movie and you can see ties to certain characters to certain characters from the original without being derivative of the original film and and hanzo was like kind of the brainchild of both nimrod the director and robert rodriguez the producer being a fan you know there's some lineage with quentin tarantino's hanzo as well from his movies and and from the yakuza movies and yeah so um i felt First off, to say, uh, I had never done a Hollywood movie before then, not even a small little part in a Hollywood. I'd done, you know, I was a New York, you know, downtown theater guy who'd done a a few independent films, um, but nothing on this scale. So um, to be part of that, um, that legacy and to to have been so lucky to have that to get that kind of a role, you know, and uh, I remember as a child really relating to Billy, the character Billy in the original Predator, and um, Hanzo is like kind of a descendant of Billy, and so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the original question? I can't so, <laughs> so, what was it like to see the actual Predator in in in, in person during the film? Oh, you know, um, we didn't meet. Um, we short, sort of shot chronologically. So you know, as as ha- as uh, as you as you know, um, you don't meet the predator until like pretty much midway through the film. And so, I I, I didn't. I, I you know, we had all this anticipation. What are these guys going to look like? And um, it was Nimrod, the director, and Robert's kind of desire to really do as little CGI as possible. So we knew that there were going to be these guys in the predator suits. Um, and, uh, I remember when we arrived in Austin, I got, uh, into the hotel and, uh, I was running down to get a workout in and I ran bang smack into Derek Mears chest because that's how tall he is. (laughs) And he is an imposing figure and quite intimidating in his look. But when he opened his mouth, I couldn't believe what a sweetheart he was. And that went across the board with all the gentlemen who played the Predators. Um, You couldn't meet a um, more talented, hardworking, um, and sweet and professional group of people. Um, Yeah, and and I spent a lot of time mainly with Brian Steele because he's the man who played the um, Falconer Predator and we spent weeks just choreographing that fight. That is awesome. That is an amazing movie. And and, and, and talking about your theatre background because you're classically trained, um, but in the movie you hardly say anything at all. Um, (laughs) You know, how hard is it for for, for, for you as an actor to basically not say anything but just basically act through expression and, you know, you know, that way of acting. 
Yeah, um, I made the mistake of early on, you know, when, you know, I, I hadn't met Robert Rodriguez until I got to set. Um, I they, they cast me off of a self-tape that I did. And um, when I met him, I made a joke, you know, by no means. I, I you know, I'm, I'm the new new kid on the block. And I was like, well, I wish I had a few more lines. And he's he turned to me and dead seriously said, those are the best kind of roles. And he just dawned on me and i was like oh my god you're so right and i started looking at watching you know i had the original predator movie on heavy rotation in my trailer throughout the shooting and i'm watching it and realizing just how in action movies just how little dialogue there is um and specifically with certain genres of films like westerns and you know clint eastwood in his early career or most of his career you know established his career without barely saying any lines at all and uh understanding the power of the image and how much of a visual medium film is in particular um in comparison to television or theater and so yeah it was a learning experience and um had a lot of people helping me along to kind of figure out how to use the camera to my advantage and to nimrod's uh, credit and everyone's credit they made me look like a rock star and uh really um yeah it, it does feel like um uh, an old school character from uh either a john ford movie or a Kurosawa film. I watched a lot of Kurosawa films at the time as well. And do you get approached by a lot of Predator fans then, uh, wanting autographs and, uh, you know, appearances at all? Recently, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it comes and goes in waves, and I'm I'm amazed at how well the film has aged. I, I should go back and watch it in its entirety again. <laughs> Yeah, and then going from one franchise uh, being pre- yeah. the you know the Predator to Born yeah. Legacy, I mean <laughs> the right. Jason Bourne movies are absolutely amazing, uh, mm-hmm. and you was in Born Legacy. Um, That's again, correct. we see you, um, you know, as as the bad guy, um, and we see you in mm-hmm. one scene which is amazing, which is the motorcycle chase which mm-hmm. in, in true born fashion is full of action. Mm-hmm. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. What was that like filming that scene? Okay, yeah. Uh, by the way, Hanzo, I would say, is an ambiguous character. He's not, not neither good nor bad. But um, I, I, ne- I never see my characters as either good or bad. But yes, I do t- seem to play um, more villainous characters or at least deadly characters. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the born the born thing again you know like this is a, an amazing um example of where you know the ups and downs of a an actor's career you know at the time i was back in new york working on a you know backstage in a tiny tiny theater working on harold pinter's uh the dumbwaiter a really small downtown production um when I got a call from my manager saying, oh, you know, that audition that you did six months ago for The Born Legacy, uh, the director now wants to meet you at the studio. And uh, so I, you know, went to the studio and uh, the guy, you know, was asking me, uh, Tony Gilroy was asking me if I rode motorcycles. And I said, yes. And how I felt about doing action. I, you know, and the, the part I'd read for was this tiny, tiny role. I couldn't understand why they were asking me all these questions. I was like, well, I got it. Yeah. The scene that I did. Um, yeah, I, I got that. I can, I can do that. And he's like, no, no, no. What, what we have in mind for you is the baddie at the end of the movie. Um, we have a script in this vault, take about 30 minutes to, um, you know, read the script. And, so under lock and key, I opened um, I opened a vault and there was a, a script and I read the whole, th- I sped, you know, I sped through the whole script and I get to the end and the last 25 pages are, it says, um, action sequence notes to be filled in by Dan Bradley, the, st- uh, the second unit director. And there's just blank 25 pages that are blank. <laughs> Uh, so needless to say, it's a 25 minute chase scene, which involves me, you know, and he kept asking, and I understood why now, uh, uh, in retrospect, 
he really wanted to know if this downtown actor, this New York uh, theater actor could handle the action. And I said, well, listen, um, I did this movie called Predators. Um, you should take a look. I, I can send you a copy. He's like, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll, we'll get a copy. I guess he, he hadn't seen my work already. And so, you know, then he got then, you know, I gained his trust a little more. And then he called me in a few more times to the studio and they had me get on a motorcycle and prove that I could was competent on a motorcycle and then sent uh then they finally cast me and sent me through a two-week boot camp here in la where i went through stunt driving stunt motorcycles parkour classes and w- wireworks classes because they had me jumping off of an eight-story building wow. on wires uh, yeah yeah so so what what percentage yeah. of that 25 minutes was you was was the majority you or Oh, so like in all born movies, this is kind of the deal. Like Matt Damon had to do this. Um, Jeremy had to do this. I had to do this. So on and so forth. Like Oscar Isaac, all those guys. The thing is, the actors have to do a lot of the stunts. Right. So it, it, the process is usually they'll set up the stunt. The stunt guy will go through it a few times and then you'll do the stunts. Obviously, it's not me sliding that bike. It's not me crashing into another car. You know, that's way too dangerous with, you know, f- 50 cars on, you know, <laughs> pedestrians all around. But it is me driving that car. You know, it is me jumping off the building. Um, I'm I'm on that motorcycle. I, it's me jumping from that scooter on wires to the other motorcycle. Um it's me uh, punching the guy off of the scooter. It's me jumping onto the scooter. Yeah, so a lot of it is me. Um, it's me riding that motorcycle without a helmet, by the way, which is wow. pretty scary. And did any yeah. any part of that scare the hell out of you? Or, or was that like rehearsed beforehand and you was completely fine with it? <laughs> I think now um that i'm now currently married with two kids it would have scared me a lot more <laughs> i would have really had to think no honestly like anything could happen yeah you could. know you could be going really slow on that motorcycle there's you know it's the streets of manila is very very rough you know streets and stuff and so and they did the best to prepare everything make sure everything was clean but accidents can happen we were in the midst of a you know that the driving section we shut down about um two three kilometers worth of road three lane road with 50 what they call nd cars which are cars cars driven by either stunt people or trained kind of people that drive these cars um in a row in a straight line and i'm in i'm in the third lane, Jeremy and Rachel are in the Rachel Vice are in the left lane. So in the center are all these cars, and there's the camera on the left lane as well. And so I'm driving one handed with a gun in my hand, and the the director wanted me to at the end of passing about fifty cars, I would start uh, merging into the left lane, like overtake these cars merge into the left lane and begin the crash or the beginning part of the crash and not actually crash yeah and as i as i was speeding up with a camera person in the back who uh you know we were rushing to get the shot before you know we lost the light and the guy wasn't even properly strapped in we're barreling down this road i'm about to like overtake and a man who'd been waiting for probably five hours to cross the street to get back to his house this poor pedestrian decides at that moment to run across a (laughs) three-lane essentially a highway and i had to slam on the brakes and the camera guy goes lurching for (laughs) nearly like decapitated me with a 50 pound camera you know uh yeah yeah stuff like that can happen luckily no one got injured and we just lost the shot and had to re you know reshoot it on another day because we lost the light but you know things like that can happen so yeah (laughs) <laughs> um so yeah you've yeah. been you've been being part of two great great franchises and then yeah. moving towards um the main reason why I want to speak to you uh, sure. we we passed Supergirl uh which is yeah. a fan favorite and you play the hat uh, and I've got to yes. say 
you, uh, you, there's a line in that show that is the best line of all the seasons of Supergirl, where you turn around and you say, I love the smell of revolution in the late morning. <laughs> and it's just the way you deliver that and the way you say it, it's like, yes, that is an awesome line. Was that in the script or did you think of that line? <laughs> no, it's in the script. It's an homage. It's an homage to Apocalypse Now. It's, That's uh, what I thought. Right? It's, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I love the smell it's, of napalm. Um, yeah, you know what? I, it, it just, it's just it's Robert Duvall. Yeah. Robert Duvall in the helicopter, right? As they're napalming the, uh, <laughs> the poor uh, Vietnamese yeah. village uh, below them. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. was it, were, were, was it fun, fun to be a uh, DC supervillain? Oh, that was so much fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, again, you know, fun challenges and. You know, I never thought I would get into action going to theater school, but so much of that, you know, the, all the hat tricks I had to learn and and the embodiment of this character, there were so many elements of my theater training that came into uh, came into play, you know, uh, movements, clowning, some of the dialect work, you know, all that stuff uh, comes into play. And yeah, it was so much fun. Well, well, what, yeah. what, was, what was the one thing you hated? when studying um you know acting uh was it was it like stanislavski's uh, method of acting check is it check off and and metamorphosis oh and God. all that lot i mean uh uh you know to be honest i mean we're, we're classically based so no actually check off was great um yeah, you know, we we weren't really stanislavski based but i had done a lot of that before going to graduate school and um no, the thing that I had bleeding out of my ears was Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, um, which, which by the way, has come in handy, especially like Hunters, when I have these like massive dialogue, uh, yeah. massive monologues, which are not unlike soliloquies and um, being able to learn to use the language in a compelling way um, was really useful. But at the time, I was just over it. I... You know, and 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 the funny thing is, I haven't done any Shakespeare since I've been out of graduate school. <laughs> I've had some, I've had a few opportunities, but uh, the timing just wasn't right. But and I, I would love to, uh, yeah. Don't get me wrong, I would love to do some Shakespeare in the not too distant. You know future, what? We can but, leave. Yeah. We can leave that to Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen <laughs> because because they are the masters at it. And you talk That's about true, being yeah. from a theatre background and going in. To action yeah. well look at yeah. hugh hugh jackman you know he was singing in yes, o- o- yeah. o- oklahoma and uh wolverine right. and all that lot um yeah. so so yeah so going on to the yeah. main reason why i want to speak to you which uh this is the reason why i actually purchased amazon prime um i've i've got to say when i saw the trailer for hunters i thought wow what an absolute amazing show. And the storyline and the concept and and had Al Pacino and the rest of the great cast like yourself. Um, I mean, how did Hunters come about for you? How did you actually get the role? Um, Interesting, yeah. Uh, oh my God. These things are so... Uh, you know, this is my third Amazon show. I'd done, I had done um, The Man in the High Castle uh, and also Bosch. And so I think the 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 people at Amazon knew who I was, um, and at the time I had a friend who was working in the writers' room, was one of the writers of the show, an old playwright friend of mine, and I was shooting Supergirl at the time, and she said, "Hey, hey, listen, I was in Vancouver, right. and she said, hey, listen, I'm the writer of this show right now, and there is a character who's one of the regulars, and I think." you could play this role like this would be a good one and i if i had a quarter for every time someone said that i'd be a very rich man it's never worked out but i said okay send me the script or you know she said well i can't send you the script but uh, let your agent know and my agent inquired about it they sent us the script and i i only got the pilot actually and then and i got the sides uh which was the uh, the monologue from episode 7 and I put myself on tape from 
my hotel room in Vancouver with my wife on the other end on an iPad reading opposite me and my iPhone shooting the audition uh, well, as, I, as I cobbled together every light <laughs> that I could find in my dim hotel room. Uh, and that's how I auditioned. And uh, I sent one copy of the audition to my manager and agent and uh, another copy uh, to my friend who is the writer who sent it straight up to David Weil, the creator of the show. And um, I got, I got messages from both the casting director and my, my friend at the writer writer's room that uh, they very much like my tape. And then there was talk of me traveling to LA while I was in Vancouver. And I, I was just like, I, I don't think I can get down there. I'm in Vancouver right now. I guess it was all a ruse that they had really liked uh, my work all, all along. And um, a few days later, they made me an offer. And that's the way it went down. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, I When I read the pilot, I thought, this is the best pilot I've ever written, read. And I want desperately to be a part of this show. And, and that has never worked out for me, but it, it did this time. And, oh, my God, uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess all the stars had aligned. Yeah, I mean, the story itself is is amazing. So it surrounds itself uh, around the Al Pacino character, and it's about Nazi hunters in New York in the late 70s, and you play Joe, one of the hun hun hunters within the show. I mean, what was your first reaction when you actually read the story? I mean, in that script that you had, did it give the whole outline of, you know, what the what the show is going to be about not at all not at all um you know it's kind of a blind uh leap of faith that you take uh you sign you sign a contract for six years and but <laughs> what i could tell was from wait a second six years yeah, yeah uh well they have an option of right. taking picking you up for six years that doesn't mean they're going to make six years worth of hunters but in, in okay. most, <laughs> I was getting excited. most u.s tv series you sign a contract for six years so they have an option. Wow. They have an option every year to pick up, pick you up, um, or or kill you off. <laughs> or so, in the so series. That, yeah. that, so that six years is that for that show or for the actual uh, company? No, that's for that show. For for oh for wow, the oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Um, oh, excellent! Well, I, I, yeah, please don't take that as any indication that they plan on six seasons. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, <laughs> we can only wish. Well, we, we can only we'll wish. Go season by season. <laughs> but um, what was the original que question? Uh, yeah, so so it's just you know from getting that first script, ah, okay. your impression yes. of the story, and if you actually knew what the the whole outline was going to look no, like. No, I was captivated by the pilot. I got the pilot to read and nothing else. I got episode that one little monologue from episode. Episode seven, but from there I could fill in all the gaps about the character. I was like, "Wow, this is an intriguing character, a Vietnam veteran, an Asian American Vietnam veteran who is suffering clearly from his experience in the war." And I so desperately wanted to play the character from from just that. I I really I was like someone who could write such a character with so much depth, an Asian American character. I'd never seen something like that. I'd never seen something like that. And I said, I, I need to be a part of this. I really desperately want to play this uh, character. And I, I feel like I'm in good hands. And so I took the leap of faith. And what a character to have. I mean, going from predators to hunters, you know, the characters couldn't be any further apart because, you know, you play this troubled veteran and that that scene you're speak, speaking of was absolutely mesmerizing. It really was to watch, and it was fantastic. And the show is very quirky in some places. It's not what you expect, and it's so dark in other places. So one second you might have a little chuckle to yourself, and the next you you're just sort of feeling a bit sick inside because of the subject. And but it's just such a powerful show. Um, I mean, you know, how did you approach Joe? Uh, you know, when, you know, you read that he was a troubled veteran, how how did you approach the character? How how did you build that character? Well, I took a deep dive into the Vietnam War. Um, you know, I grew, right. I was born in 75 and I grew up in the 80s with lots and lots of, of Vietnam War movies. But 
never have you seen in the movies or TV a character like this, an Asian American. So then I, I started going into research about Asian American soldiers, of which there were many soldiers, um, and the kind of trauma specific PTSD that they were suffering. And if you can imagine, you know, coming from coming from the U.S. already, you know, where a Japanese American man who just you know uh, twenty years earlier may, may have been born or uh, grew uh, not not twenty years, but thirty years earlier may have been born or grown up in a uh, concentration camp in the United States is now fighting uh, for the U.S. in Asia. Um, maybe fighting a war they don't necessarily believe in all of a sudden. And now they're um, killing people that are essentially that look just like them. And and then I started doing research and uh, hearing stories about friendly fire that, uh, you know, um, uh, their own troops not not being able to identify these Asian Americans as their, you know, as their their cohorts and and firing at them and also certain uh, a lot of tr- trauma from within within the barracks um i read a i read a, a, a um, an account by a veteran who had uh who had been beaten badly by his own um barrack mates um while taking a shower um some and from then on would take a, take a grenade, a hand grenade to the shower every time. And so that, that really stuck with me. And I, I used all of that as the kind of backstory. I had to create that backstory because, as you know, there isn't much of that um, until much later in, the, in this show. Yeah. yeah. And what was your favorite scene to, to shoot as Joe? Oh, my God. So many. Um, <laughs> there is many. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The action guy in me loved a scene in episode uh, nine. Uh, the ma- yeah, that was um, a lot of fun to finally like get to get to spread my you know show them a little bit of what I could do action wise. Yeah. Um, although there is action throughout the series, it's not on the it's not on the level of Bourne or or Predators. You know. <laughs> um, uh, but it, but it doesn't have it doesn't have no, to be completely no, no, over the top at, action, not, does it? Not at all. And you know? <laughs> and and frankly, I I've been you know spending the last ten years trying to kind of establish myself as as a dramatic actor, not an action guy. You know, and I um, yeah. the the great thing about the show, like you said, is the mix of tones. So I really enjoyed the kind of odd couple dynamic I have with Josh Radner's character, Lonnie Flash. So we have a kind yeah. of, um, he's kind of more of a loose cannon and the, the kind of, uh, slightly comedic scenes that we have. And, and also I really enjoyed, um, some of the more kind of tender moments I have with Roxy, um, played by Tiffany Boone. That's something that I haven't really gotten much of a opportunity to do in my career as well. Um, so I show the softer side in me. So I would say, you know, the scenes I had with those two characters, um, any any one of those scenes, I would I would pick as some of my favorites. Obviously, working with Al, um, my hero growing up, I can't, uh, I can't, yeah. And uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Like Lena Olin, by the way, is one of my heroes from the '90s, and to be able to be on screen with her was, I can't tell you how excited oh, I amazing. was. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I was going to ask if you gave any advice to Al Pacino. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. did you learn anything from Al? Because, I mean, I've interviewed quite a few actors that have worked with people like Marlon Brando. And and we often see these people as, as legends, as as not real pe- pe- people. But I, I presume that when you met him and you knew that he was on board uh, with the show... Um, you know, what is he like to work with and where, what is he like, you know, off camera? Al is still an artist after all these years. You know, he's still in search of that thing. He's still, he doesn't never phones it in. He's like, he, he is the consummate artist. Um, what else can I say? Like, um, I would watch him do the simplest things like, um, 
giving Jonah, the character Jonah, played by Logan Lerman, a hug. But every take, the hug would be just slightly different, and every time would be like amazing, you know, and different in its nuances. Even simple things like that. Um, recognizing that Al probably has seen every kind of scenario or scene known to man, you know, at, at this point in his career, and understanding, oh, yeah, it would be a good game that I would play in my head. Well, what famous Al Pacino movie would this scene be like? <laughs> <laughs> you thinking of Heat? So, <laughs> oh yeah, I was like, oh, that's from Heat. Oh, that one's Godfather Two, <laughs> definitely Godfather Two. <II. laughs> and and are we going to get a season two? Because it does it does leave us. I, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it does leave us on a, a, a quite a cliffhanger. Uh, do we know if season two has been uh, announced or going to be renewed? I don't know that, but I can tell you that it's not. It wasn't intended to be a limited series. So, as you know from from oh. how the show ends, um, um, it's all yeah. I it would be very um, yeah. I think audiences would be very unsatisfied if there wasn't another season, and I would be too. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot more. A lot more story that Joe needs to explore. Exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, there definitely needs to be a season two. I think we should start a uh, a social media campaign <laughs> uh, to get Hunter's season two announced. And what's what's next for you? Because obviously, with the lockdown, mm -hmm. everything's sort of being slowed down uh, production wise. Um, what's what's next for you once everything gets lifted? Wow, it's so nebulous right now. It's a very scary new world out there. And so everything is kind of, you know, there have been grumblings and uh, we're finally starting to hear about maybe things starting up. But, you know, everything is unknown right now. You know, we have unions that are involved. We have big insurance companies that are involved. I know the studios desperately want to start uh, start up again. You know, uh, certainly pr producers want to start. Everybody wants to start up again. It's just getting everyone on board on a unified plan and making it safe for everyone to kind of work again because it could easily, you know, backfire and it could be a very dangerous situation, especially on set where you have 200 to 500 people in close confines actors as actors we can't wear masks obviously on and while we're shooting um we're often in more intimate kind of environments and so yeah some of the proposed protocols are just insane when you hear about them and how, how often you know we're talking about daily testing and quarantining being you know away from families for months at a time uh, it's it's just i don't know <laughs> but what i well what, it's exactly yeah. like I'm sorry. Yeah, it's exactly like the school system as well, yeah. because obviously they're trying to get the kids back into school. But you talk about social distancing right. and um, it's near enough impossible with a six year old. True. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. T yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did. I did want to say I did want to say I have been I have been. Um, I have not been. It's been, it's been an introspective time period for me. I've been reflecting on my career, actually, and I've been reflecting on the kind of work I've done and the kind of work that I would like to continue to do and the kind of work I would like to branch out into doing more of. And I've been um, I've been working, actually, five minutes ago, when you first called and I missed missed the FaceTime uh, call, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just putting the final touches on a film treatment uh, of a book that I'm adapting into a film. Um, I'm very excited about that. It's very different from Hunter's, but it's also um, very, very necessary for this time. It's it's an Asian American story. It centers around an Asian American family. Uh, it takes place in three different time periods: in 1980, 1965, and 1945. And um, you know, with the rise of all this kind of xenophobia we have in our country right now this kind of new surge of xenophobia towards asian americans i really do think it's it's um it's a good time to kind of reflect on our past and put it into context with what's going on right now and any idea of when that's that's going to come to light in in production and well i'd have to i 
I'd have to sell. I'd have to sell it first. Yeah, I'm. But that's the thing. I'm. I'm in the dream phase right now. It's a little further along than the dream phase. The story is there. The for, story is fully flushed out. It's. Um. Yeah. I hope. I'm about to bring it out into the world, and I hope that there'll be people out there who'd be interested in making it and realizing this dream. As I suppose that's another plus side, I suppose, of the lockdown is that when the lockdown gets lifted, mm -hmm. all this creativity mm -hmm. that all these artists are having, it's going to be an explosion of of ideas and and creations. And that's right. So so you know, looking forward to seeing all these new shows and ideas come come to light. But Louis, thank you so much for spending the time with me, talking about Hunters, uh, especially, because I'm a massive, massive fan. And, I, you know, fingers crossed we get season two. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, you know, all, all the best to the fam family and the little ones. Um, and I look forward to everything that you do in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And um, I was really glad to talk to you today. Look after yourself, Louis. Thank you. All right. You too. See you, sir. See you bye soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Be More Super, the podcast. It was kind of a crazy, fun experience. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Listen, my whole family loves it, man. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and share it with your super friends. In my world, it means hope.